straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. Hello and welcome to the program for June 30th, 2020, which in the Hebrew calendar is the 8th of Tammuz, 5780. I am Walter Bingham. It's been a week of guessing and expectations all about sovereignty over the rest of our land. Is now the right time? Some Israelis believe that we must take note of international opposition, while others say that as a sovereign state we should not look too much over our shoulder and act according to our interests, which means sovereignty now. If so, should it be according to the Trump plan, or should we annex other part of Judea and Samaria, or even all of it, as well as the Jordan Valley, in fact, establish the state of Israel to extend from the river to the sea? Here is an analysis of the situation as I see it and published it in the Jerusalem Post. I, on the list of topics in Israel and one of the most discussed subjects in diplomatic circles of the world, is Israel's proposed and imminent extension of sovereignty over additional parts of our country. This is perceived by most of the international community as depriving Palestinian Arabs of their land illegal under international law and making it impossible to establish a contiguous Palestinian state in the West Bank. The date for its implementation as published by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is July 1st. There is, however, a great deal of confusion as to the precise extent of this proposed sovereignty. A variety of options have been suggested depending on the political affiliation of the proposer. First and foremost, after a prolonged period of hype, there is the Trump deal of the century, promising Israel sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. Besides the so-called major settlement blocks, the map that has been published shows a confusing array of dots and dashes representing a number of isolated Jewish villages to be included in the plan, while an estimated Up to 25 smaller communities are doomed to be destroyed. This adds up to just 30% and is effectively severing 70% of Judea and Samaria to become a Palestinian state. Not the deal that the Israeli public was led to believe, but a scheme aimed to appease Palestinian demands. I'm John O'Vandor. And I'm Ross Nichols. Join us on our program, Israel on My Mind, a show that broadcasts all the weekly goodness that flows like milk and honey from the Holy Land straight into your ears with humorous and happy news stories. New shows are posted every Thursday at 7 p.m. Israel time, highlighting the lighter side and advancing a positive view of Israel here on Israel News Talk Radio. And now... Here is Walter Bingham. It's not the deal that the Israeli public was led to believe, but a scheme aimed to appease Palestinian demands. Further, it merely serves to fulfill the aspirations of US President Trump to achieve peace between Israel and the Palestinian Arabs, a feat that no one before him could accomplish. In the end, his plan for Middle East peace will, like all others before him, also end up in the dustbin of history. It was surprisingly naive to believe that the Palestinian Authority leadership would freely accept a plan that places Israeli towns and villages as islands under Israeli sovereignty dotted within what is earmarked for a Palestinian state. Our interlocutors have already condemned this plan because, firstly, they claim that it prevents contiguity and free movement within their state, and secondly, that they will never tolerate Israelis within their sovereign area. That's a condition often repeated by Mahmoud Abbas, yet Arabs reside and move freely inside Israel. 
In any case, the Palestinian Arabs' demands are much wider. Within Israel, there is division and debate if it is politically and diplomatically advisable to implement any extension of sovereignty at this time in light of strong international opposition and warnings by even the warm Arab states that such action will severely harm the relationship. Therefore, as neither the Palestinian Authority nor the Arab countries in the region will accept that kind of Palestinian state, the Trump plan is effectively dead. Prime Minister Netanyahu is facing a dilemma. There is a considerable constituency even within his own ranks requesting him to nevertheless declare sovereignty according to the plan. I'm not sure if it's the Trump plan or his plan. Jeff Barak, former Jerusalem Post editor and seasoned journalist, asks this week in a piece in the Jerusalem Post if Israel has survived and prospered for over 50 years without annexation, what's the rush? Well, if we will ask Nadia Matar or Yehudit Katzover, today's leaders of Women for Israel's Tomorrow, a grassroots movement known as Women in Green, they will tell him that precisely because we have already waited so long in the hope that a solution would be found, it's now time to end that illusion that peace can be achieved by giving up yet more of our homeland and establish another country within it, and that Eretz Israel, La Am Israel, that the land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel according to the biblical promise made by God to the Jewish people. More secular supporters who advocate for total annexation from the river to the sea base their claim on the resolution of the Balfour Declaration of 1917 and the San Remo Conference of 1920 and the recognition of the State of Israel by 162 member states of the United Nations. The Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 announcing support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, then still part of the Ottoman region. The declaration was contained in a letter dated 2nd of November 1917 from the United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the British Jewish community, for transmission to the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. The text of the declaration was published in the press on November the 9th, 1917. The San Remo Conference, which was convened three years later to decide the future of the former territories of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, one of the defeated central powers in World War I, resolved and specifically noted that the mandate for Palestine will be responsible for carrying out the Balfour Declaration, working for the establishment of the Jewish national home without prejudice to the rights of existing non-Jewish communities. There was no mention of an independent Palestinian state. The San Remo and Balfour declarations refer to Palestine as the area which included today's Kingdom of Jordan. Those who class the Balfour Declaration as merely a letter of intent have to be reminded that the full text of the Declaration became an integral part of the San Remo Resolution and the British Mandate for Palestine, therefore transforming it into a legally binding foundational document under international law. It is also important to note that there has never been an Arab state in Palestine. Its Arab inhabitants have always considered themselves to be part of the great Arab nation historically and politically and as an integral part of Greater Syria, a designation that extended to both sides of the Jordan River. The 1916 Asia Minor Agreement, commonly known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, named after its British and French negotiators, made a mess of the area between parts of Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean Sea by dividing it arbitrarily into administrative zones, regardless of religious or tribal considerations, of which the western part was one of the sections given to Britain. That was the creation of what we today know as 
the troubled Middle East. Taking all that into consideration, the Jews with trimillennial history in this land, now the modern state of Israel, have an indisputable right to the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. The question is, what will the consequences be following a total annexation of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley? Would it be better to take what we can today and kick the can down the road hoping to annex more another time, as is the view of some Israelis, or to annex all and face the music? It is certain that even by implementing the Trump plan there will be the strongest international condemnation, maybe even threats of trade embargoes and isolation. We may have to expect that, or alternatively surrender to pressures and intimidation that will never change and set a precedent forever. To believe that we could ever recover from such a mistake is, as Nadia Mata would say, an illusion the uproar of the international opposition would be no stronger and no louder if we were to take courage and once and for all extend sovereignty over the whole of our land, from the river to the sea, as it would be by annexing piecemeal, highly improbable, beginning with the Trump plan. The choice is either total annexation or face the same music each time we make an adjustment, even if only to build a road. The eminent lawyer Alan Dershowitz reminds us that Menachem Begin said, and I quote, Israel should never be concerned that acting in its best interests will cause the loss of some congressman's support. Israel has thousands of years of persecution in its history and does not need to answer to anyone. There is no substitute for being strong. Weak Jews with morality on their side end up in gas chambers. End of quote. Israel is strong enough in every respect to overcome these temporary disagreements with the international community. Countries' long-term interests, such as to benefit from Israel's developments in science and technology, determine their policy and will overcome any pressure to prevent the return to the status ante. So, Prime Minister Netanyahu, use this window of opportunity to ensure your historic legacy to have completed what Menachem Begin started and established the final borders of the State of Israel from the river to the sea, so that we don't have to wait for Mashiach. I would like to have your view, so please write to Walter at IsraelNewstalkRadio.com where you will always get my personal reply or place your comments on the appropriate place somewhere under the Walter's World page where I shall see it and perhaps even reply. Six months ago, my program included the story of the pivotal role played by the German railways in enabling the Holocaust. Because I had many requests to repeat that segment, I decided to include it today. The subject that has been, and still is today, more fully and more often discussed than any other is the Holocaust, particularly in Jewish circles. The subject of the Holocaust is something that can never be exhausted. So, as history unfolds, there are always aspects that are new and throw light on how this factory of death was made possible. Today, I want to talk about just one facet of the operation. In fact, it's the one on which the whole operation depended. In order to facilitate this, the greatest atrocity of recent times, many of the victims had to be transported great distances across Europe. And that was the task of the Deutsche Reichsbahn, the German railway system. I was nearly on one, but that's another story. I'm pleased to have on the telephone the man who knows more than any other about the German railways during the Nazi era, Herr Alfred Gottwald. He is the curator of that part of the German Museum of Traffic and Technique in Berlin, 
that deals with traffic on tracks. In other words, the rail system. Welcome to the program, Herr Gottwald. Hello, Mr. Binger. I noticed from the map that the museum is situated by the side of a railway line. Is that of significance for the exhibits? Yes, of course. The railway objects are based in an old uh, railway shed, and that means we can show all the railway objects in their, what we call, natural background. And there is a railway line from Berlin to Prague via Eresienstadt. Hi everyone, this is Andrea Simento from Jerusalem inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simento, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson. And me, William Hall. On the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. So I'll come straight to the point of logistics. The network was extensively used to transport Jews and other so-called enemies of the state from many parts of Nazi-occupied Europe to concentration and extermination camps. How were such trains integrated into the normal timetable? Well, it was always a task for the railway company to offer slots in the timetable for accidental transportation. One of the accidental transportation demands was, of course, the army, and others were school parties or a circus that would travel by train. And these ordinary railway officers who dealt with special trains also dealt with trains that were asked for by the Reichsführer SS and his staff. They had to apply for a train. And about 95% of all applications were answered positively. I believe that such trains had the lowest priority and were unfortunately often held in sidings for long periods, sometimes in sweltering heat, causing extreme discomfort to the victims. Was there no other scheduling involved? That's a very difficult question because there is very little information about how the inhabitants of the car were supplied with water. We know from uh, people who have survived that type of transportation that they suffered tremendously, but there are very little uh, paper records or records from the accompanying railway officials or police officials. Was anything at all supplied? Sometimes the journeys took 48 hours or more. The Jews that were to deport us were told by their organization or by the police, bring food for three days. So that would normally cope for what the trip was intended, but water normally was not brought along in sufficient quantities. It is clear that you cannot bring water or anything to drink for two or three days. So normally the train would stop in between and people would get water. This was obviously a good business for the railway. Did they charge per person and who actually paid? The surprising thing, it was a business as usual, that is to say, the price for transportation is composed of the number of people in the train and the length of travel in kilometers. And as that was a big number and a big value, the Reichsführer SS would get a 50% discount on third class rail fare. The Reichsführer SS, that was of course Heinrich Himmler, who was in overall charge. Yes, he was in overall charge and his office stamp was the office stamp above Heydrich, who was the chief of the secret police, or above Adolf Eichmann, who was the officer in charge of transportation and logistics of the SS. So what can you tell us about the use of the rolling stock and how such trains were organized? Were there sometimes passenger cars used? In the beginning, ordinary third-class cars were used, like for a holiday train, for a number of reasons. 
The first reason was that the annihilation of the Jews had not yet come to such a rough style as one year later. So in the autumn of 1941, passenger cars were used. And in very particular, the army would have such a strong demand for freight cars that no freight cars were available. This changed over the early months of 1942, when it was clear that the roughness, the quality of transportation, if I may use that word, became worse by month and month. And a new quality, if I may use the word, of transportation came into existence for the Polish Jews. They were transported over shorter distances and with much more violence. They were often killed before entering the train. They were killed in the ghettos. That was a completely different manner of behavior of the German police than you could observe it within the German Reich. I'm not going to say that any of the behavior within the German Reich was decent, but within Poland it was much worse and that type of behavior and of aggression against the Jews that reflected backwards into the other areas like France or the Netherlands or uh, the Deutsches Reich. Who was guarding the trains and how many guards were there? There was a standard and that was up to one officer and 12 to 15 what we call green police. That's not the secret police that, that were also directing the road traffic and so on. They were ordinary men, ordinary policemen. And did they have a car to themselves at the end of the train? Most of the time it was in the middle of the train. There were no communication means from one car to the other. These police officers would often leave their car and get onto the platform when the car accidentally would stop at a platform of a station. Were there ever any mishaps, any train accidents? There is one description of a proper train accident in Poland, and there was a survey of the attorney of state on the reasons of the accident and on the question even why the guards were shooting on passengers. But of course, this court case was closed down as soon as it was clear that those passengers had no rights anyway. They were trying to flee the car when the cars were demolished. Were there any other breakouts or resistance en route? Not so much in transport from Germany, but we know that, for example, some Jews from France, sailormen who were strong and young, tried to escape from the cars and they went off the car close to Frankfurt on Main. But within about a week, they were rounded up by the locals since it was pretty obvious that a male person of 25 or 30 not wearing a uniform simply was not allowed to exist within the German Reich. There was also a train from Brussels going to uh, Auschwitz where some young Polish Jews that were not on the train halted the train by a false signal and they opened some of the cars and I think 200 people ran away but they were facing the same problem. There was hardly any infrastructure within occupied Belgium to support them for a longer period. So most of them were rounded up within a fortnight. Now, back to the museum. Apart from a large working model railway set and the general rail exhibits one would expect, what does the museum show about these infamous trains? It was part of my particular and personal occupation when I entered the job that the role of the German railways during the Third Reich would be much larger than in any other museum of the time. Particularly since we are only a mile away from all the central offices of railways and police and government in the Third Reich. And so it was clear that we would once have a wartime austerity locomotive and we would also have a what we call a bot car, that is a freight car for cattle and grain and so on. It's a symbol for the use of the railway for deportation in the years from 1942 onwards. Since our museum started having a boxcar on display, many colleagues from other museums have come here and asked for help in getting a car for their own collection. The character of a boxcar as a symbol for the Holocaust has, has been promoted by the Deutsche Technik Museum very strongly. But do you have any audio that people can hear or descriptions of what happens? The sort of thing that you've told me just now, all about the transports. 
have a lot of explanatory plates around the car with pictures and we have a video screen, an interactive screen where you can ask questions and get answers. We don't have at all in the, in the railway exhibit any audio texts. We expect people to look and to read themselves. It wouldn't be too noisy. Well, in other museums they have those things and mm? people can listen to, sometimes with headphones. Do you show any records of transport at all? We have a large list of the transports from Germany and a map with transports from different countries all over Europe. This is all we can do at that very particular spot. Are the numbers of people that were transported shown? Oh yes, of course. The calculation that we have conducted beforehand come up to roughly 3 million. 50% of all Jews that were killed in World War II were conveyed by railways before their annihilation. And we give figures for the different countries and within Germany we give figures for every city. What are the reactions or the responses of the people about that particular part of the exhibit? Well, I would hesitate to say it's a good response, but what we can see is that many visitors are taken, they are impressed. We were fearing in the beginning that many people would ask, what has that got to do with railway history? But the question is not asked. I think all the visitors understand that this is an important part of German railway history. Has the museum ever interviewed any railway staff that was involved? You must keep in mind that uh, the museum was only opened in 1988. That would mean that every railway officer who was part of that logistical program would have been 80 years or older. And we know, like from the film of Claude Lanzmann, that they are very hesitating to answer. But you may know that German uh, police and justice officers have uh, interviewed many railway officers to a very limited result. Most of them were saying, oh, I could only look forward when I was driving a locomotive or I would sign all the timetables without reading them. That was typical German bureaucracy lies. And I did not think it was sensible to repeat these interviews 20 years later. Who was in overall charge of the railway? Well, there was a transport minister, Julius Dorfmüller. He was quite an old man. He had his 75th birthday in 1944. And that is the first thing you can criticize about him. Why would he remain in office, though he had the right to retire? But he was a work addict, an alcohol addict. He was an addict of Hitler in a way. It's a very complicated question. And the most interesting fact is that right after the end of Hitler, General Eisenhower would ask uh, Julius Dorfmüller to rebuild the German railway. So for a long time, all other German railwaymen would say, oh, Dorfmüller has been given a free pass by Eisenhower, so what do you want from me? In fact, Eisenhower was not acquainted to the detail, and he obviously thought it was more important to have a running railway operating system than bringing Dobler to custody straight away. But they did know that the history of Werner von Braun, of course. Oh yes, and many others. Leap of Faith with Penina Taylor. We live in the age of information, but not inspiration. If you're like me, you're looking to be inspired, to reach higher, to connect more, and to grow. Well, if you want to get warm, you need to stand close to the fire. And if you want to catch fire, you need to stand close enough to get hit by the sparks. Join me, Panina Taylor, as we walk with people who have embarked on a spiritual journey towards Torah. We'll uncover what started them on their journey and what truths they discovered along the way. So prepare to be inspired as we take a leap of faith every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Israel News Talk Radio. Here is Walter Bingham. But Dob Miller died in 1945, and the second man in the railway, a man by the name of Gunston Miller, he knew that they would chase him, and he was running away to Argentina and would only come back uh, in 1953 or 1954. And was he brought before the courts? Many years later, it took a long time until he was brought to court in 1973 for participation in mass murder in a couple of hundred thousand cases. 
But then he was profiting from a proper German justice. He had a heart attack in court, and uh, the doctors would say that whenever he gets into rapid movement or into rough action, right. he might suffer from a heart attack again and die. So the, the case had to be closed and carried on living for 23 years. Ridiculous. That's absolutely incredible. Now, let me change tack. I read last week that the first ever such train operated 70 years ago on June 14, 1940, on a 140 kilometer route from Tarnow in Poland, and that it was commemorated a few days ago in Poland with an identical journey. Firstly, can you confirm that date? And secondly, do you believe such a commemoration was appropriate? Well, it is a very difficult question to answer. I'm not arguing with anybody, but we would say that certain trains from Vienna and from a place in Czechoslovakia by uh, late 1938 are to be considered the first uh, systematic deportation. But is it appropriate to commemorate such train journeys by repeating them? I would not do it, but I am not criticizing other people about how they do commemorating. How many visitors do you get to your department? Well, the museum has half a million visitors every year, and about 80% of them make the way to the railway collection. So that would be roughly 400,000. What about school parties? Do you get those? Oh, yes, more than 50% of our visitors are school parties. It is part of the education program, but I'm not an expert on what and how 10 or 12-year-olds can learn about the Holocaust by having a look at the car. I think children learn more about tolerance by interaction. Are these school parties drawn from a large area or just from Berlin? from a large area. We are surrounded by the county of Brandenburg, and I think all of the school children from that area come here. And you may keep in mind that Poland is only 50 miles away from here, and we have free entrance for school children after three o'clock in the afternoon, and every day you see three to five bottles with Polish school children standing outside the museum entrance. Oh, that's wonderful. What's the optimum time that one should spend in your department and how long do people generally spend? Well, we have a survey about visitor behavior and visitor qualities and it is interesting to see that the average time that a visitor spends in the museum is nearly two hours. That in fact means the museum is too large because within two hours you can't see it all. So many of our visitors, that's also part of the survey, come two or three times. The most important feedback that I heard, and that was quite heartbreaking, that I once met a lady from Hungary who had been transported in one of those cars, and she was absolutely upset. She would say, why don't you put a gas chamber on display? So this went for me, for my heart, and for my beliefs all the way wrong. I wanted to inform about the participation of the railways in the Holocaust, and she was thinking, that we put the Holocaust on display as something the Germans had done all right. That made me think quite a lot, but we did not change the exhibition as I believe that the feelings of a survivor are very important, but that is a different group of museum visitor to the younger people or to those who did not live in World War II. It is widely known, and we have touched on that earlier on, that almost all of the German population of those days denied all knowledge of the subject. But with that amount of such rail traffic, there must have been many people involved from the management of the railway down to the people who cleaned the trucks after use or even operated signals. And didn't they talk to family and friends who in turn talked to their friends and so on? And as a such kind of talk goes around very quickly. And when the trains stop, surely the noise of humans in close goods or cattle trucks could be heard and would attract attention. How could the whole country deny knowledge of this? Or was it the rail personnel that was prohibited to speak? That's a very complex question. After the war, many of the railway men, as well as the policemen, would say, oh, I was not allowed to talk to my family. There are quite a few books saying that this was only true to a limited extent. You must also keep in mind that other scholars found out that uh, the German population profited from Hitler. 
they profited from buying the property of the Jews that had been deported or they were profiting from jobs that were getting vacant when the Jews were sacked. This is part of the national psychology that when you take part in a crime or fraud of another group, you are not inclined to talk about it afterwards. I'm not embellishing this, but I'm trying to explain why there is so little description of it. The part that the railways played to a certain extent was not getting very close to the ex extermination places. I know that in Belgium or in Sobibor or in Treblinka, of course, the trains were pushed into the extermination camps, and it is clear that the railwaymen knew what was happening there. But if you look at the number of those people who were actually having a look, the number was not very large. That's not to say it was a secret, but I think that the pressure on them to talk about it was not as strong as was the pressure on SS men, who, though they were doing their duty, <laughs> so to speak, held the moral power to talk about it. It somehow had to get out of their minds that they were doing something that a few years ago was a crime, and now they do something in the idea of the government. It's now 70 years since the Holocaust. Two generations later, what is the attitude among Germans today to such museums? Do they support it, or are they fed up hearing about it? I think that today, in particular after the end of the Iron Curtain, that there is a new interest, a new wish to know among the younger people. But I'm surprised myself, and you could see that when the book by Daniel Goldhagen was on sale, that many young people went to the book release because they were thinking, we don't know it in detail, we want to know more and we want to learn about it. You are certainly right that those who are uh, 70 or older say, oh, it's enough now. In addition to the Nazi atrocities themselves, should such denial of the German people not also remain as a blot on German history of the 20th century? You are certainly right in suggesting that, but you will know that within England or within America, the denial of the Holocaust is not a crime, because in those countries, the freedom of speech is being considered to be more important. Um, I think you cannot control thinking anyway. So I personally find it difficult, not as to the Germans, but as to everybody, to penalize false thinking. I think that's the wrong way. I must admit that I failed to reply to Herr Gottwald that today again, many Germans are not only thinking. Herr Gottwald, curator of traffic on rails at the German Museum of Traffic and Technic, thank you for having come on Walter's World. And please make sure that your elderly neighbors are looked after in these difficult times of COVID-19. They are particularly vulnerable and therefore housebound. And you can help to make their life more bearable. Goodbye. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 
Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.